The date 161 A.D. may be comparatively correct for an important revelation by compilation of certain doctrines that were available in the Near East at that time. The actual structure of the Kabbalah shows that it is profoundly indebted to Gnosticism, the sect that was flourishing at that time in North Africa and in parts of Syria, a sect which has come again into prominence in recent years from the discovery of the great Gnostic library at Chenobaskian in central Egypt. Uh, the Gnostics taught a doctrine of emanations as a means of reconciling the Creator as an abstract principle of God and the creation as a concrete structure uh, the problem of bridging between deity in its universal and mystical sense and the formal universe. This problem was one of the great problems of Gnosticism and uh, it is also one of the essential elements in the great Kabbalistic system. Also at this time we must remember that Mahayana Buddhism was rising in India, perhaps had already risen. And this conveys another important element, which perhaps had been generally neglected in the Near East, and therefore was felt to be necessary in the unfoldment of Jewish religion. Uh, the Kabbalah, for example, deals with a basic problem of the difference between transcendence and imminence. Transcendence in this sense means the transcendence of God. Jewish religion had, orthodoxly speaking, created a God above and superior to the world. This deity uh, rested eternally above the world and the planets and beyond the grasp and contact of living things. Seated on its eternal throne, it was an absolute despot over creation. This distant, all-powerful God, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, uh, was scarcely the concept of deity most useful to the Jewish people during the Roman captivity. Uh, the Jewish Empire Kingdom was gone. These people had received a tremendous spiritual disaster into themselves. This, the, this disaster undermined faith. It undermined the old way of life. It seemed to cry out that God had forgotten Israel. It seemed as though there was too much of punishment and not enough of forgiveness in the divine nature. This God of powers and glories, this El Shaddad the Strong, was not the type of deity that could comfort a sick, forlorn, and miserable scattered people. Something nearer, something more immediate to their lives was very necessary to them. There is really no doubt in the world that this was also one of the mainsprings of Christianity, which arose in the same general area, and also came to a people weary and disillusioned and tired. Now, this sense of Christian immediacy certainly profoundly affected the religions of the West, especially through the Christology of St. Paul. So it is quite possible that Mahayana Buddhism, which had this uh, tremendous emphasis upon the immediacy of spiritual authority, that it was not something infinitely remote, but something infinitely available. The deity was not far away always, not looking down from an omnipotence 
upon a tired world, but that in some way deity was here. Deity was therefore imminent. It was available at any moment to be reached, to be understood in some measure, uh, to bestow its consolation uh, upon the suffering heart and the broken pride and the tortured soul. This Mahayana Buddhism uh, accomplished in connection with classical Buddhism, which was the rather austere doctrine that Gautama gave the world. This doctrine of Gautama was also too transcendent for the average Hindu to live by. He needed this softening, gentle touch. He needed this doctrine of the Bodhisattvas, the wonderful beings who with their great ears listened forever to the sorrows of men, who were always available through prayer, and who interceded with the universe as consolers of human sorrow. The church fell somewhat into this same problem, and from it instinctively, patterning upon older peoples, Christianity developed its doctrine of saints and the doctrine of intercession, by which the individual, in his spiritual need, was able to bridge the interval between humanity and divine help. So we have in Kabbalism this arising among a people previously almost completely deficient in this particular attitude, almost uh, entirely uh, lost in a strange spiritual austerity, something perhaps suggestive of Brahmanism, something suggestive of the wonderful, deep, but incomprehensible wisdom of the universal power itself. Men could not live entirely supported only by the belief that God was wise. They had to also experience the fact that God was good, that God was love, that God was ever-present help in time of trouble. It therefore would seem reasonable that during the difficult periods in Jewish history, a number of sects should arise, like the Gebels of Hebron, the Nazarites, and the Essenes, who were to emphasize uh, this phase of the Divine Presence, that not only to the great scholar, the learned master of the Sanhedrin, would this spiritual presence of God be known, but also to just ordinary people who could reach deity in some inward experience of their own. While uh, the old Jewish system did not emphasize such intercession, it was to a measure present, at least archetypally, in their beliefs. For the system of Jewish prophets is almost unique in the religious literature of the world. These men of the wilderness and of the desert, these comparatively uncouth persons who dared to rise up in the presence of kings and threaten the wrath of God upon the unbeliever or the disobedient, even as the prophet from the wilderness dared to stand up and accuse David the king. So there were these men of the wilderness who lived close to God and who seemed to speak with the authority of deity. And this group together were called the prophets. And the Old Testament contains a number of prophetic books attributed to them. And all these books imply that these prophets had in some way attained knowledge of the divine will, of the divine purpose, and were therefore empowered to warn the people of the wrath to come. At the same time, we find running through uh, the Kabbalah uh, interesting scientific elements. And most of these elements probably must be traced back to the Greek Pythagoreanism. 
It is sometimes held now that the Essene community at En Gedi by the Dead Sea was originally founded by Pythagoras. In any event, uh, the Greek system certainly influenced both the Essene school and the Therapeutae of Egypt, another mystical Jewish community. The um, monadology of Pythagoras, his doctrine of number and numeration, uh, certainly has become so associated with the Kabbalah that today many people popularly referring to numerology will call it Kabbalism. Certainly the Kabbalah did deal with a philosophic use of number uh, to represent principles, to represent forces and powers, and to reduce universal processes to numerical equivalents. Also, the old idea of reading uh, the meaning of names seems to have risen from this concept. For today, numerologists will take the letters of a person's name and uh, finding the numerical equivalent of these letters will add them up, place them under the discipline of notoricon and gamatria, as it is called in the Kabbalah, come to a sum number composed of the letters of a name and then attempt to delineate or to variously analyze that person through the number of his name. Also, the ancient Hebrew belief that the days of man's life are numbered. Now, we have always interpreted that to mean that he could only live so long, but that these days might be numbered in some kind of a mathematical or magical manner that has not generally occurred to the reader of Scripture. So, in the numerical system of Pythagoras and other aspects of Greek philosophy, we find material which later passing through a certain Judaistic interpretation was embodied into the structure of their Kabbalah numbers. Uh, Rabbi Akiba in the Sefer Yetzirah, uh, which was the book of the numerations, also gives us valuable information as to the numerical equivalence of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So here we have another phase of the subject. In Kabbalah also, as it passed particularly down into those dark and mysterious years, which we know as the Middle Ages, certain elements of necromancy occurred. And uh, to what degree this was essentially different from the demonism of Europe itself, which was passing through a psychological condition, uh, which seemed to make these metaphysical things a little too real. What the relationship was, we do not actually know. But we know that magic mingled with alchemy, that magic is to be found in many of the old hermetic books, and that the various grimoires, or books of conjuration of spirits, all make use of Kabbalistic elements. Thus the signatures of angels and demons and all of these mysterious rites by which spirits were invoked out of the misty deep of space. All these came finally to be called Kabbalism. Agrippa von Netzheim was one of those uh, scholar, mystics, esotericists, who combined magic, hermetic arts, the Kabbalah, into a strange and mysterious compound. Uh, which caused him considerable religious difficulty before he got through with it. But at the same time, the policy was present. This is probably one of the reasons why, after we came out of the Dark Ages into a more modern point of view, that the Kabbalah was held in fear or disrepute. It was because it seemingly had been associated with demonology and witchcraft. It was also used and is still used in some parts of Europe and even in parts of Asia where Jewish communities exist uh, for uh, helping so-called possessed persons uh, to get rid of evil spirits and things of that nature. 
All of these encrustations, however, actually belong to what might be termed the misunderstanding of the subject. Now, uh, the Jewish congregations in these dark periods were not much better informed than their Christian counterparts, and as a result, superstition was general. And out of this, these superstitious practices uh, have come much of has come much of the bad reputation from which the subject has suffered. Let us assume then, for our purpose at this time, that the Kabbalism really began uh, not necessarily among the Jewish people at all, but certainly it arose in a period extending between the 6th century B.C. and the 4th century A.D. This millennia that lies in that span was in that time just about as cataclysmic as our modern world appears to us. New religious interpretations had risen in India and China and Persia. Great philosophers had come to Greece and Egypt. And the centers of culture at that time were moving rapidly in their spiritual understanding uh, from a more or less archaic foundation uh, to the very position which modern religion now occupies. For actually, religion as we know it in the world today has not greatly changed since this critical period between 600 BC and 400 AD. During that time, almost all of the spiritual beliefs which we hold to be valid today were rising and developing and unfolding and integrating in the ancient world. Therefore, if we go to the great religions of the world, the only important religion that lies outside of this barrier and still survives is Islam. And Islam was certainly a byproduct of this system or situation though it did not arise for another 150 years.